two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to the Self Publishing Formula podcast with James Blatch and Mark Dawson on another Friday. And this Friday we have a celebrity-like interview because somebody who is a well-known name is big and has sold, I think she totted up roughly three million books since a standing start in 2015. We all have standing starts. What you mean but, is... She, well, no, because somebody could have been... And, was, and hit number yes. one with her first book. Yeah, she could have been famous before. She could have had a trad career behind her, but she wrote her first book, decided to write a book. It's quite annoying, actually, when I say it out loud. <laughs> yes. I should have yeah. said to Louise, that's so annoying he did that. But yeah. she's a very lovely person and, um, uh, and it's brilliant. So we've got LJ Ross uh, in a moment. And, uh, and before then, though, we're going to hint at something that's been going on in the background on the Self-Publishing Formula podcast, which I won't be saying very much longer. No, we're not. We're, we're, we're rebranding. So we've done what, nearly 150 of these. Um, and we, yeah, we've decided it's time to shake it up a little bit. So we uh, had a little think and we, we looked for what um, names we might be able to get. And we were quite surprised that one in particular, which was like blindingly obvious, hadn't been, the website hadn't been taken and there is no podcast. I'm not going to say what it is yet, but it's, um, it, it is, it, it couldn't be more ideal. So we snapped that, um, and um, we're in the as we record this, we're in the process of um, doing some snazzy new um, intro graphics. We're actually commissioning someone to do that for us, and we had, or James and John went up to London on Friday to meet with um, a celebrity voiceover artist, which was yeah. quite entertaining. Um, so we might as well see who that is. It's uh, Huey Huey Morgan from the Fun Loving Criminals. Now. I, I, I know from being, from we talked to a few people in the States when we, when we went to Nink, that won't mean a lot to everybody in, in the States. And it's one of these weird situations where he is very much an American. He's, uh, he's from Brooklyn, I'm guessing, um, or somewhere in New York. But he was wearing a Houston Astros cap when we saw him, but I'm not, not sure whether that means he's wearing a Miami Dolphins cap, but it doesn't mean I'm from Miami. No, know? that is true. So, yeah, he's... Um, very reasonably well known over here. They had uh, Fun Loving Criminals had a song called Scooby Snacks. I think it was called. Um, I'm thinking this what 20 years ago, maybe. Uh, probably, yeah. 25 years ago, but yeah, it would be longer than that. So, um, quite big over here, um, but I don't think they're that big in the states. And I was trying to think actually of an analog for that. So the the reverse, and the one I came came up with was Bush. So there's a band called Bush. James on, on the podcast is looking at me like he doesn't like Kate Bush. Talk about. And George Bush. <laughs> I don't know. Bush, Bush with Gavin Rossdale is the um, the lead singer. He was married to Gwen Stefani, and he's oh, yeah. he's from like the north of England. It's an English band. They're very big uh, states, um, right? Or were very big, and not big at all over here. So one of those okay. weird situations. And I think Huey is, is. I may be speaking slightly out of turn, but I think it's similar. Um, but anyway, that's interesting. Well, I mean, all my English friends were going, "Oh my God, you're in the studio with Huey." assumed that we were being debauched and he is you know fun loving criminals was not just a clever name for the band he is somebody who had a a, a rough start to his life and did break the law and probably did end up in jail after reading his wikipedia page to know for sure bit like you bit like me um but singing was the way out of it and he is uh he's done a lot since then although that was their their big hit the band had a few albums he's done a few solo albums he's actually a keen writer he's got a fiction book in his head he wants to get that down so obviously he was quite uh, pleased that we, there was a course he could yeah. take. Um, <laughs> we should have said um, that we, we could have um, we had to pay him some money we could have uh, offered him yeah, yeah. our services anyway uh, well, we will uh, we'll keep in touch with you. He's a lovely guy, actually. And um, and from my point of view, because it's a technical process and getting the voice down, and you always worry slightly when somebody's a bit of a name that as soon as you say, could you try that again, that they're going to go, well, what was wrong with it? You know. But he was absolutely, you, you guys are in charge, whatever you want. And we changed his voice a little, just slightly. But we chose him because he's got quite a punchy, I mean, 80% probably of our listeners we think are in the United States. Somewhere between 70 and 80 varies a little bit. So the US is a big market for us. It's the biggest single country for us to have an American voice at the beginning. Also, I think tunes into where the majority, the biggest turnover of indie authors is. Um, and it's fun because it's kind of 
got that little bit of energy at the beginning which we want and so and we're going to reveal all of this shortly so we're in the process at the moment of commissioning some of the bits and pieces that go around it and at some point probably november i'm going to guess we are going to have uh now we haven't made decisions about we're going to keep the same sequence number i think oh yeah so the back catalogue is there. And in a slightly pompous way, and with me and my journalist hat on, I look back at the 150-odd episodes we've done, and I think there is a, a piece of history being laid down for generations of a really exciting period of time. It's a snapshot. All these interviews we do uh, will be uh, will give historians in the future, should they want to chart the transition in publishing, our podcast is as good as anybody else's to track all those changes. We're making history, Mark. That is very pretentious. But as... But of course, it's absolutely true. Yeah. So, Churchill said, journalism is the first draft of history. That's even more pretentious. And um, we, we, will, we will put all of these podcasts in a time capsule and bury yeah. it under your shed. <laughs> <laughs> Send it to future, Jupiter. Aliens will excavate the, the time capsule and go, who the hell were these... these yeah. Things? <laughs> They'll be, um, they'll be astonished at the insight that we're giving the world. Okay. Should we talk about LJ Ross? Yes, why not? So, um, yes, I've known Louise for a little while now. So we've, we've done lots of Amazon stuff together. So, um, I mean, just this year I did London Book Fair with Louise on a panel. We spoke together at the Amazon Academy in Wales um, a couple of months ago. And we've, um, we, yeah, we've done lots of things. So we've, we've been to Old Frop House and done an event there. And it's just, so I've, I've got to know her and James, her husband, quite well over the years. And um, Louise is a, is a phenomenon. There's no other way to put it. I was, we had dinner together because um, we were at the Amazon Storyteller Awards last week. And we had dinner together with, also with Joseph Alexander and our respective partners afterwards. And um, she, or her husband actually told me how many copies of a pre-order that she's got going at the moment that they've done. Um, and I nearly fell off my chair. I mean, I, I, I'm doing pretty well. Um, so, you know, I should, should hit a million dollars uh, turnover this year. I'm not going to suggest, I'm not even going to guess at what Louise is, is on. Um, and most, I think most of her audience is, is skews heavily towards the UK, but she, the number numbers of pre-orders were ridiculous. Um, fact is better than what I can do with the last Milton book. So she is, she's an absolute phenomenon. Um, and you know, good and good luck to her. She's really lovely. James is a really, they're both really smart. Um, and lovely people, so it couldn't you know, it couldn't happen to, to nicer people. Yeah, no, and she, um, you're here in the interview that she lives in Northumberland, very beautiful part of northern England, and that's where she sets her books around and about, so the geography of the area plays a big part in that. And um, all of these things add up to why her audience is loyal to her, and we've said it before, and we'll say it again, <clears throat> that niche, show me the niches, I'll show you the riches, niche works, <clears throat> excuse me, um, online. Um, so you don't have to try and think, I've got to appeal to everybody, actually just writing something from the heart that's specific to you will you I don't surprisingly think she doesn't write in niches I know you're well, you talking about lo location is one thing but it's not it's that a, isn't that's a part a of it niche. I mean um, Peter James writes about Brighton and sold mm -hmm. 18 million copies Louise has sold 3 million copies um, she, I suppose what um, I mean is being specific is good yeah, she well, she writes very is a very specific geographical area, but the genre she writes in is very big, one of the biggest in in the UK. Um, and I mean, I, I've I've never been to Northumberland, um, but I wouldn't, what? but that wouldn't prevent me from buying one of her trying one of her books out. Um, and it's it's very interesting. I mean, I, I'm I, so much so that I'm thinking about starting. I haven't think for a while about starting a new series um, set in Salisbury um, with a mm. private detective. No one has done Salisbury apart from. Vladimir. Um, yes, he's done Salisbury. <laughs> done Salisbury, and um, I'm quite tempted. I think it could be quite interesting. There's lots of history here. Uh, you know, you've got the cathedral, Stonehenge, um, Wiltshire is an interesting place. I think it could be quite a fun place for me to write about. So, and that's that's yeah. really looking at what Louise has done and thinking, I wouldn't mind giving that a go. What, detective, a oh, private detective, private investigator. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm, like it. A sort of Salisbury noir, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Good. You like your noir, don't you? Okay. Well, look, it's time for us to hear from Louise, having uh, spoken about her. So we caught up with her in a hotel uh, this week, or as it stands, last week in London. Uh, let's hear from Louise, and then Mark and I will be back off the back of the interview. LJ Ross. 
Hello. Louise Ross. I must ask you about the uh, choice of name at some point. Remind me. Okay. J.K. Rowling, Joanna, <laughs> J.R. Blatch, James. Oh, yes. Yeah, mm. Big decisions to make. Right. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. Thank you for um, having me. We've wanted to get you on actually for quite a long time, and I've seen you at LBF yes. a couple of times. I know you've been busy bee. I move like a shadow. <laughs> and also, you live 200 miles north. That too. <laughs> in the United Kingdom, but we've tracked you down to uh -huh. an opulent hotel in central London. <laughs> Because this look, actually looks on the video looks like your house. Uh, well, <laughs> I've found a bit way I'll sell a few more books before. <laughs> well, but, um, yes, you've sold we a did. lot of books. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons that you're a bit of an indie superstar. Well, You've been described, you. I think, as the Queen of Kindle somewhere. Goodness. That's quite a hefty title too. <laughs> but yes, thank you. You've written some brilliantly absorbing books and a great series. And we want to hear all about it. So I'll talk a bit about how you got into it. Sure. Um, and then we'll talk a bit about process and marketing and so on, if you're happy with sure, that. Sure, sure. So let's start with um, where it all came from, because I think mm. relatively late for you, for yes, writing. Yes, so I mean, I had a first career. Um, I was a barrister in London, so I, um, I did that for a good 10 years, and I worked in the regulatory field, so healthcare, then financial services, so I used to work for the FSA as was, and, um, and then ended up in private equity before deciding, you know, maybe it was time for a change. Um, because also, I mean, at that time, I, I don't think it, it was several factors, but I don't think it would have been compatible with the kind of family life that I wanted to have for myself. I mean, it works for some or all individuals, you know. Um, but for me, I wanted to try um, and pursue something a bit more creative, although at that point, I wasn't entirely sure what that would be, because I think, you know, it's true to say that a lot of people might have a dream to do something, but how often do we actually allow ourselves to pursue a dream because it seems so frivolous, doesn't it? You know, when you have bills to pay and all the rest of it. Well, a lot of people say, I'd love to write a novel. Yeah, exactly. Um, a lot of people say it. And it's just finding that moment in time that works for you. Um, and for some people, it's they can work part-time and write part-time, or they can just sort of find snatched hours at the end of the day. Um, for me, I kind of took the nuclear option and decided, look, you know, I definitely know that I want to do something different. And I resigned my position and um, I decided, look, take six months, maybe do a bit of travel, uh, have a look into what you really want to be, you know, for this next stage in your life. Um, because I'd enjoyed the first part and, uh, you know, everything that came with it, but I think I was ready for another challenge. Um, and I'd always been a great reader, you know, read for years. And I used to read on the tube on the way home, um, and that was my escape. You know, some people really love films and television, but for me, it was it was definitely reading, um, and always had been. So uh, you know, but it's a big leap to think. Well, I enjoy reading. Could I then be a writer? Is quite a leap in your own mind, isn't it? So um, it is. Kind of so you ha <coughs> you're a reader, but you hadn't had thoughts from a child onwards of wanting to write or? Well I didn't think so but my mum would argue yes because she produced these um, forgotten little books that I'd made that were all illustrated with animals coloured in and everything and stapled together down the spine so I obviously as a child maybe I had this notion but I'd forgotten about it over the intervening years um, but she produced it as evidence okay. so I thought well okay <laughs> there must have been something there. Um, but no, I definitely, uh, I hadn't really thought of myself as a writer um, at all or the possibility of it, but until I gave myself that opportunity in time. Um, well, that's really interesting. So I'm fascinated to know how you went about becoming a writer mm. from, from scratch, because normally this is quite an evolutionary process for people. Mark will tell you he started yeah. writing stories as a 10-year-old boy. Yeah. So by the time he sat down and tried to do it commercially, it was quite a lot already there. You sat down fairly clinically and thought, well, how do I become a writer? Well, um, yes and no. I mean, I had done a lot of writing in my day job, you know, I mean, but it was just a very different type of writing. And I mean, I'd been formally trained in drafting, for example, so, you know, knew all about the kind of um, formal processes of writing. But turning your mind to then writing accessible fiction from writing something as dry as a legal advice is, is a very different skill. So that was kind of a transitionary process. Um, but what actually happened was, so I'd, I'd left my old job and I decided I'd take this time and a couple of things happened actually. The first was that we found out we were expecting our son, which was wonderful news, but it also gave me this opportunity on a, a kind of styled maternity leave to, to really focus on something different. Um, and I'd thought to myself, in Northumberland there's this um, beautiful island, Holy Island, also known as Lindisfarne for those who don't know it, and it's a tidal causeway island, it's cut off by the sea twice a day, and it's beautiful and very atmospheric. And I'd always thought to myself, wouldn't it be great to set this closed community murder mystery whodunit style on an island like that? But I never really imagined that it would be me to write it, so um, it was definitely a leap. But I thought, you know what, I don't want to grow old and grey and have regrets. 
I must try. And if it's a total washout, well, no one will, you know, have lost anything but me. So I thought well, I'll just give it a go, and and that's what I did. Just sat down and really just let it flow. I think looking back over the books that I've written, Holy Island was the book that really just flowed from nowhere. You know, it was a story that just kind of um, took its own course as I wrote it. So did you do any research into the structure of a novel? And um, it wasn't so much. I mean, the thing is, you could argue two ways. I mean, I, I didn't do a creative writing course or anything like that. Um, but I think that if you read widely, you can start to look um, with more of a practiced, focused eye, even as a reader, on on how people are structuring the novels that you enjoy. So I think that if you start thinking in that in that way, and if you've already decided that you want to write, then you start reading books that you enjoy a second and third time, but with a different eye. So to that extent, I was doing my research on structure. Um, but in terms of research on um, the place, the setting, and the history of the island, I mean, that was just a joy, you know, reading up all about that. I mean, some fantastic books. There's a book called The King in the North, um, the Sounds like Game of Thrones. Well, it was. Well, it, well, actually, you know, I think I'm right in saying that George R. R. Martin based a lot of his, um, well, it, it was take a lot of inspiration from um, Bamborough Castle and Lindisfarne Castle, which was also inspired Tolkien, I think, um, for the two towers, or the twin towers. So, yeah, it's an area that definitely inspires uh, plenty of writers over the years, and yeah, I'm, I'm the least of them. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, um, that's. I mean, that's really interesting. So the the novel flowed. You didn't, at that point, have uh, any independent thoughts of publishing. We probably didn't really think too much about publishing at that stage. You just thought you were going to go down the traditional route, I'm guessing. Yeah, I mean, I knew absolutely nothing about publishing. I mean, zilch at that point. Um, I, what I what I said to myself was, let's just see if you can finish a whole novel and get through it, and then see what you're left with. And so I did that, kind of interrupted with the birth of a newborn, as you can imagine. Um, and so picked it up, and so that novel took a lot longer than it would take me now, obviously. Um, but it was good because with the first novel sometimes it does take a bit longer and you need to put it away um, and then come back to it and see maybe what was working and what wasn't. Um, so that worked quite well and, uh, and then at the end of it I looked and I thought well what do you want to do with this? Um, wrote a second and edited it, self-edited at that point. Um, and then thought, well, I better get myself an agent or a traditional deal. Isn't that what people do? You know. Mm -hmm. um, and so I sent it out to I think a grand total of twelve, um, which is nothing. You know, when you, when you hear tales now of sweeping rejections, uh, but I sent it out, and I had a, you know quite a lot of positive feedback actually, and an offer from a mid mid-sized press. Um, and it was my husband who at that point said, well, I don't know if you've heard of Amazon. Kindle Direct Publishing Platform, and I, and I hadn't at that stage. I had a Kindle and enjoyed using it, but I had no idea that they had this publishing platform at all. It's not something that had been on my radar. And so I had a look online, I had a look at the terms, and just thought, well, this seems like a no-brainer, you know, um, risk-free, uh, creative economic control, and I just thought, this is sounds right up my street. Yeah. <laughs> so, And I thought to myself, look, you've got nothing to lose. Because what's the w absolute worst case scenario? Nobody reads it? Well, that could equally be the case if it was traditionally published. And, and in fact, in some ways, maybe more likely because there was no commitment as to um, widespread dis distribution or marketing on the traditional side or that your book would somehow be stacked, you know, front row and center. It could be maybe one copy in a, in, a book some, in a bookshop somewhere on the bottom shelf. You know, that was kind of what my expectation level would have been. Um, and so I thought it's got to be better than that and you'll reach more readers this way. Um, and if you don't, you've lost nothing. Um, and so on the 1st of January 2015, that's what we did. Um, got it ready for market, you might say, or at least what I thought was ready for market back then. And um, we uploaded it on the 1st of January 2015. And um, by the May of that year, it had reached number one in the UK chart. So it's, uh, I think I still reel from that, to be honest. <laughs> And did you sit back, by the way, thank you for raising your voice as that very loud helicopter. Not at all, yeah. Now. It's the Queen's sandwiches, I think, <laughs> being delivered for four o'clock here in London. Did you market anything at that stage? Had you uploaded it with a nice cover and more or less left it and just... Oh, yeah, well... I've done that thing that no one's supposed to do. I know. Is to just upload it, fold your arms and wait for the money to I come I am, out. absolutely. Now, but the thing is, you have to bear in mind that I hadn't found this wonderful podcast by this stage of my life. So, you know... Um, 
going back in time, uh, yes, more or less that. I mean, I'd started a blog, but it was a very new blog. I mean, I'd heard of Andy Weir and The Martian, and I thought, well, I'm pretty sure he had a blog, and release a little bit before you put it out. So I did that for maybe three or four months beforehand, releasing snippets, a chapter here, a chapter there. And I maybe got a few readers from that who went on to purchase the rest of the book. But to be honest with you, that's all I needed, apart from friends and family, to start a tiny snowball rolling, because that's all it was. I mean, I remember on day one, I got about 25 sales, which were all of my family and friends. And I initially thought, well, that's the end of it. Well, I'm really pleased. Isn't that sweet of them? Forget all about it, you know? But then after that, about a week passed, and obviously it totally dropped off into oblivion. And then one or two sales per day started to creep up again. And I thought, there is absolutely no explanation for this other than strangers who had been maybe told about the book, friends of friends, and that sort of word of mouth marketing that sounds really antiquated now, but is still hugely relevant. I mean, here I am nine years later, and um, nine books later, I should say nine years, I'm wishing my life away. Um, no, no, nine books later, but it still applies. I mean, I still have people writing to me even anecdotally saying, I've, I've told all my work colleagues about this book and they've gone on to buy it and, oh, I told Gina about that, you know. So it's very much that sort of um, baseline level support that still applies and that's definitely the story of Holy Island. Um, and then obviously I was fortunate that in capturing a readership um, early on, it made the second and third books and so on so much easier. Yeah, I mean, word of mouth marketing is, is will never go away. I don't think no. it's been the yeah. most powerful way of marketing, um, but it normally works in in smaller numbers. You yeah. obviously had uh, what well, was the only uh, sort of earliest days of, of Kindle as well. Um, yeah, it was within, uh, 2015. Yeah. Yeah. So. In a few years. Well, fantastic! I mean, how exciting for you? How excited did you feel at the time when you saw those figures coming in? Well, excited, but also. A bit nervous to be honest because you know it's one thing writing a book it's another actually wanting people to read it mm -hmm. and that's the kind of um, it's the paradox isn't it like you want people to enjoy it but the way that they're going to find out about that is actually reading it so you, you know, exposed you do you, you do yeah. and uh, certainly I had absolutely no expectation of those kind of numbers at all so you, had, so you hadn't had it edited I had been I would say um, an edit for me now is a much more involved process. It had a couple of stages of editing, but we went back and re-edited it later um, with new knowledge. Um, I mean, it still did the trick, but you know, I think it's always a case of constant improvement. So I went back and had that re-edited properly. And so by six months, ten months down the line from that, yeah. were you making an income that w would re sort of replace your working income? Did you? To be honest, from from that sort of. I mean, I would say even from the March or April, so from three or four months in, I was making an income that I would have been very happy with, you know. Um, and again, you know, you speak to a lot of people, it's sort of where your expectation level is at and what you really want to achieve from it, because um, I have some people who say, well, I'd just like to sell enough so that I can fund a hobby, or I'd like to go on an extra holiday, I'd like to, you know. And that's kind of how I'd set myself. I thought, well, just give it a try and just see if you can make enough for a nice night out to be honest you know at that stage I, I knew that entering you and know, I don't think anyone becomes a writer to become um, you know a big cheese or anything like this it's kind of you do it for the love of reading and writing I think and everything else flows from that so that's definitely where I was um, but I was incredibly fortunate to be able to call it a full-time profession from fairly early on yeah. And did you, when did the second book come on stream then? Because uh, you'd written it at this stage. Well, I'd started writing it more or less as soon as I finished Holy Island because I'd been bitten by the bug by mm -hmm. that stage. And it is a big bug. <laughs> so, um, and then I was quite lucky that I had because, you know, you started getting some really nice feedback from readers saying, well, this is all very well and good, but what happens next? So, luckily, I started thinking about the next story. Um, and that came around, I'm pretty sure it was the September, October of the same year. So about, you know, it took a little bit longer, nine months, uh, than a usual self-published novel that I could produce now because everything grows a little bit easier with time, I think, and confidence is the main word for me. Um, but I, it, that second book was probably the hardest to write. Um, it's like a second album, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So you've written um, the book and then suddenly realised that people are going to read it and yeah. um, that's introduced you. You mentioned confidence there was an important mm. thing for you. Did you feel underconfident about the whole process? Well, you know, I, um, what I would say is that, it, you know, I was quite, I was shocked and surprised um, when the first book did as well as it, as it did. I mean, I think that's probably a good thing. It's it's nice to feel that when you, you do any project, whether you're writing a book or you're doing anything else, you'd like to think that it would succeed and that it would do well, but I don't ever bank on it, you know, I don't ever count on that. And, and actually, even now, I think it's always good to have a healthy 
um, healthy fear. You know, those butterflies in your stomach whenever I put a new book out, I never ever feel complacent that, that people are going to enjoy it as much as the last because I think if you ever start to lose that fear and that edge, something is lost, you know. Um, so. I'm quite, I'm quite happy to have those butterflies, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I completely yeah. agree with that. I mean, I left the BBC when I didn't get nervous anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Standing in front of the camera, I just yeah. thought, I've done this bit now. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, let's ask, Let me ask you about the LJ Ross, the author sure. time. It's a small thing, but those of us writing, and I'm, mm. you know I'm doing my first book at the moment, yes, and so yeah. you do have to make a decision which sticks with you then sure. for a long time. And there's famously initial surname and big examples like uh, uh, J.K. Rowling's probably yeah. the most famous author on the planet. Did you consider Louise Ross? Or? Um, I did actually. The thing that swayed me, I mean a lot of people ask me this question because I'm a writer of crime fiction and they think is it a gendered decision? Um, and actually uh, no, the reason is the J stands for James who's my, my husband and it's a permanent thank you um, for him giving me that nudge to, um, to actually firstly pursue the dream and secondly to um, to try Amazon KDP which is something that I hadn't known about before so it's a it's there as a permanent thank you but actually as it turns out I think it has quite a good ring to it so it's, yeah. it's it sort of works on both levels really. It does definitely. So James is the hidden indie superstar here, the man behind the... Oh don't, don't let him hear you say no, that. Okay. I've got to live with him you know. He's in the other room <laughs> um, for that moment. Oh good, I mean it, is, it brings us back to that point of how positively publishing is changing at the moment. Mm. The idea that you could have written that book and potentially even though you had some quite positive feedback and yeah. not really had a career take off straight away which happens a gazillion times yeah. over the last hundred years to writers and then moved on and done something else is a terrible thought yeah. but indie publishing has allowed you to yeah. thrive. Oh honestly I mean I, I'm a huge fan I just think it's such a, a democratic process apart from anything else. I, I can understand I think it's really a question of personality though as well um, I can understand equally how it may not be for absolutely everybody um, because you do have to split yourself in two in some ways. You have to be able to um, be creative and have that outlet and enjoy doing what you do but then also be hugely objective about it which is quite a big ask actually when you've really poured yourself into something of um, you know I don't know, 100,000 words or whatever it may be. Um, there's a fair chunk of your life and your time and your thoughts and mostly if you're writing as I write at least um, quite a lot of my own personality will come out in the, in the story so it really you feel very invested in it and so then to ask yourself to step away from that and look at you know your baby very clinically is, is very hard because most people would like to think that their baby's gorgeous you know so it's it is hard but um, I think I, I, that's a very good point I think you also do need to do that even if you're traditionally published because that sure. is a yeah. some authors find it difficult to have their books edited which sounds yeah. really silly but yeah. they don't really take that advice very well but you've yeah. You obviously do, you are able yes. to say, okay. I think it's true actually when you say that because um, increasingly as well as such crossover from, you know, Trad and Indie side, I mean, everybody needs a social media account of some form or another, everyone needs an author platform, everyone needs to think about these things in a different way and that's, you know, that's the changing world and the changing market. But I definitely see it as a positive because, you know, uh, having that interaction with people to whatever degree feels comfortable for you um, is actually a, a great way of getting feedback from a creative perspective and I think people forget this, I mean we get lost in the mire of talking about reviews and numbers of reviews and all this sort of stuff but actually even just one very good review that, and when I say very good I don't necessarily mean a five star review, I mean a review that really understood your book and what you were hoping to do with it but was also able to tell you something that you maybe hadn't seen about it. So I've had reviews where they've been lovely reviews, but then they might say, oh, by the way, I don't know if you knew this about that element or whatever it may be, and I hadn't. And, and it's being able to take that on board and say, okay, that's actually a really good point, thank you, because that will make me better next time. You know, and it's the long game, it's not the short game. So. And what about negative criticism? How do you take that? Because everybody gets bad reviews, doesn't matter who, who oh, you are. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I often get that question as well, and you know, how do you have when you think, well, just rip the plaster off because you're going to get that first negative review and, and several afterwards. I think particularly since, um, you know, I'm writing genre fiction, so you're appealing potentially to a very broad base of people, and you're going to get outliers at either end. Um, so going into commercial fiction like that, you know that you're going to get people who, for one reason or another, just don't like an element of your work, and that's bound to happen. So 
I think first of all just be prepared is, is how I tell myself to think. Um, and secondly also just to distinguish between criticism and critique because there is a difference. Um, and you know I, I think that people can be keyboard warriors but at the same time people can be incredibly kind um, and they can also be very thoughtful and look at a, at a book fairly and, and I think that's something to just sort of try and bear in mind when that first negative critique comes through. Okay, I'm interested to hear how the marketing's evolved since then, but let's talk a little bit more about the books before we move on to that. So you're nine books in? Yes, yeah, so um, we've got The Hermitage coming out on the 20th of October, actually, yeah. And the same Lindisfarne, the same police? Um, no, different settings. Oh. So every every one of the books is, um, well, they're all Northumberland and, oh, all of and okay, County sorry. Dome, but they, um, each book is set in a slightly different place. And okay. so the Hermitage alludes to, there's a really ancient little Hermitage as part of Walkworth Castle in Northumberland, okay. so that's where that is body found in there, you know. And has this become a key part of audience mm -hmm. expectation for you? If you suddenly set one in Provence, would it, do you <laughs> think you would upset your... Well, I, I mean, I hope not because every detective deserves a holiday, but um, the book actually, funny enough, you mentioned the Hermitage is half set in Italy in Florence, um, right. and so it's kind of half and half, but I think um, for me it's very important because actually it's where Northumberland's where I was born and grew up, but it's also where I draw quite a lot of inspiration for the stories, so I think it would be an interesting move for me, um, not writing about the region. and. With, every time I finish a book, I think, well, God, that's it, you know, I, I can't write another one. And then two weeks passes and suddenly ten new ideas pop into my head and, you know, that's how it goes. Um, so I think setting is, is very important in my books and it is part of the reader expectation, yeah. One of the characters in the yes, book. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're, um, uh, you're coming up to number ten, is that going to be number ten then, Hermitage? Or? Uh, no, no the, be... the Hermitage is number nine. Is number nine, yeah. okay. And uh, in terms of the way that you approach the structure, you say the idea is always popping into your head mm -hmm. and whizzing around. So when you sit down with pen to paper, what stage is the outline? Um, I think what I... Pen to paper, how old am I? <laughs> Unless you've got a quill <laughs> and parchment up there in Northampton. That's right, yeah. Um, I think actually I sort of think about the device. Um, so if you think about um, Agatha Christie's ABC Murders is a really good example of this. And, you know, that... Um, they kill off, I think, two people before the third murder, which is actually the one that's relevant. And so it's that sort of device there was cloak and dagger and, and what she was doing with that story. And so when I kind of approach a new story, I think to myself, what kind of device might I like to use as a general story arc? Um, how am I going to approach this and why then would a character do this? You know, what purpose would it serve? What's the motive? And you kind of work backwards that way and that's how it works for me. Um, and then setting weaves around that very nicely. And how did that differ from the first book, which you said flowed? Did you have any structure written down at um, the beginning? Well, I had, uh, you know, obviously with the setting, it kind of lent itself to that closed room mystery. So I already knew that there would be a limited number of suspects for whatever murder might happen there. And then when I sort of reminded myself of the history of the island and looked into um, some of its kind of pagan history, for example, and, and I thought to myself, you know, what kind of nefarious characters might have got lost in this quiet corner of the world and why you know and, and what also might they do um, to hide what are essentially really ordinary deeds um, and so people are using um, I don't know mysticism and things like this to really mask what is a very ordinary killing you know and it's I think uh, trying to find higher purpose behind something that is very base and so that was kind of what I was talking about with that, that book but it did flow once I had the idea of this character who was at that point unnamed, um, once I had this idea in my head it sort of really flowed and one thing I knew for the main character which is Ryan, I kind of wanted him to be incorruptible and the reason for that is um, probably a reflection of where I'd just come from um, and we all draw on our life experiences and this is how it came out for me. But I'd just come from working in the square mile, it was very dynamic, um, there was, uh, you know, I was working in adjacent to financial crime and things like that um, and so I kind of thought to myself how wonderful it would be to write escapist fiction where you have a person who is entirely incorruptible or at least appears to be and with each new book there is a sense that he's being tested in one way or another and that his resolve and his moral compass is continually being tested with each new crime and so I think there's something comforting about that as a reader, you yeah. know, to think that you're going to get to the end of this journey and, and he's going to do the right thing or what he believes to be the right thing. Uh, it's interesting though because a lot of authors do want their character to have flaws mm. um, and be sort of 
bumping up against them all yeah. the time, but you wanted this guy to be a paragon. Well, I wouldn't say paragon. He's incorruptible, but okay. he's not. He's, he's not without flaws. I mean, okay. he's. Um, yeah, he can be very black and white in his approach to the world, which you know, in its shades of grey, really, isn't it? Yes, kind of incorruptible. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, which obviously does lend uh, a dynamic yeah. to him, which will impact on the story. And I love that you, you mentioned about using how would people hide their deeds or their behaviour. Mm -hmm. That's that's how you brought the landscape into the books, isn't yeah. it? That's how yeah. it's firmly planted in. Yeah, and it's just also just drawing on the history. And there's so many, you know, legends about. Um, you know, people being, I mean, when you think of the Percy, like Harry Hotspur and all that sort of stuff, um, you know, the history that we have in that landscape is amazing and just being able to take inspiration from that is often helpful as a, as a springboard for my own kind of plot lines, which is great. Great. We yeah. should say how many books have you sold now that you're coming up to number nine, having um, started well, with no uh, expectation at all? Yeah, I know. Um, probably over three million, something like that. I, you know, I don't know the exact figure, although... Uh, it's always kind of tricky working that out, but I think probably in that area. Well, congratulations, yeah. Louise. That's, <laughs> that's fantastic. We're so happy and excited to share that with you. Um, okay, let's talk about marketing then. So in those early days, mm. a blog was, yes. was more or less <laughs> it. Today, what does your marketing setup look like? Um, well, in some ways, I've never actually forgotten that. Um, and I do definitely, uh, I'm very much at the risk of sounding like an old John Major. I'm kind of back to basics in some ways. Um, and I, I do say this to people because I think there's so much information it can sometimes be a bit um, of an overload, isn't it? You know, because you look at it and you think, well, gosh, I'm not doing all of this and maybe I should be doing that and should I switch it up? Um, for me, I have to say the disclaimer that I was quite an unusual case in that normally, as I understand it, it would be a few books in that people are building a readership and you, you sort of build, build, build all the time. And although that's true, I was fortunate that my first book did as well as it did because that helped with visibility hugely. Um, so what I would say is, you know, don't judge on book nine, judge from point zero um, because that's sort of going back in time. But now, um, because I have been able to sort of uh, build that readership, I definitely you know, I've always agreed with um, Mark's advice about, you know, um, having a mailing list. I think that's invaluable. And I know it's old hat by now, but it's still true. Um, I definitely would agree with the basic principle that um, never forget your product. Because I think that, you know, I, I sometimes um, see books that are beautifully packaged and they have a fantastic cover and wonderful copy, but then I'll read the book and maybe feel slightly disappointed. You know, and I mean, I know these things are subjective, but I think the general point there is that um, if you know your readership, don't forget them. I think that sort of ties in with a marketing point that once you start in the process of publishing and you kind of um, become a little bit more established, it's easy or tempting to um, fall in line with mini trends or things that other people are doing or that, you know, the style that other people are employing. And, it, and it's difficult to kind of remain, it's that word again, objective. It's difficult to set yourself apart from that because on the one hand, writing is very um, introverted, uh, but on the other, you know, you like to socialize with people, you like to hear what they're doing and how they are writing and, and what their work is looking like, just as a reader yourself. But then to not be influenced too much by that and to focus on what is working for you. Um, and that comes back to marketing, really, I think, because um, the more IP that you can create, and that's really what it is, um, and the more you can continue to um, improve um, uh, whilst also remaining true to, uh, at the risk of sounding a little bit pretentious, your own voice, um, I think that that actually works really well from a marketing perspective because if people enjoy book one, they will read through. Um, and that comes back to another point that Mark's made about read through, that, that really kind of feeds into that, that the only way you're going to get high read through is if your later books are every bit as good as your first books. And when I say good, I mean good in the eyes of your readership um, because it isn't necessarily about writing for other writers um, which is a very different thing entirely I think. Yeah that's great advice I think I could probably go to almost any industry it's like yeah. a car manufacturer producing better and better brochures yeah, exactly. um, and in the end it's got to be about the product isn't it yeah. so how close are you to your readership? I would say your I, readers readerships I'm yes I mean I, I'd say uh, pretty close actually I think they're a very loyal readership and very kind readership and but having said that you know I, I do always say to people if you possibly can um, take the time to cross the road and reply to an email that, that somebody has taken the trouble to send you and um, because as I said earlier people are so kind and a lot of the time um, 
a sort of formulaic response just won't do. Um, and particularly when I look at my demographic, you know, I think um, it's sort of roughly late 30s through to maybe mid 60s, mostly female, well educated. Um, but we are, you know, we like to hear from one another. And um, if a lady's written to me and, and said, you know, I had a really tough week this week, and my husband died, or whatever sad news it might have been, and your book managed to take me away. Uh, thank you for your email. We will reply. So it doesn't really wash, you know, and, and I would feel upset myself if that had been the reply. So even if I can't do it the same day, I, I will always flag it and I'll go back and have that kind of personal interaction. And that is something if you want to think cynically, it's something that will also work in your favor from a marketing perspective because it's a positive interaction that someone's had. If you think about you know, face-to-face -face sales, if you go and ask somebody for help in a shop and they sort of brush you off, you're far less likely to go back there again. And it's exactly the same with books. If, even if you're speaking to a stranger, a total stranger, it's much better to try to empathize, I think, and, and understand what they're trying to tell you, um, whether it be positive or negative, actually. Because oftentimes, if people are really connected with the characters, I've had readers write in and it's clear that they um, have so enjoyed the books, but they maybe didn't think that a storyline was going to go the way that I've written it, um, which is interesting, you know, uh, because I have no way of knowing that, and this is just where I thought the story would go. And I understand from their email that really it's connected to their love of the stories rather than an intention to be negative. So often I'll write back and say, oh, that's really interesting. I'm so glad that you connected with the character. Tell me why, you know, why, where do you think they would go? You know, and we end up having a conversation about books then <laughs> rather yeah. than rather than it being a negative interaction. So um, does that type of feedback ever lead on to ways in which you'll write in the future? Um, yes and no. I mean, I think um, I love to hear, I've been very lucky, I mean, get a lot of um, senior police get in touch and say, I used to work for Northumbria CID, I wish we could have been like that, you know, and, and that's the thing, you want people to realise it's fiction. Um, yeah. I mean, I do have a knowledge of police procedure from my previous lifetime, shall we say, um, but I sort of deliberately try not to overload my stories with that, because otherwise you'd be writing a very different book. Um, and I like that people understand that. So people who have even worked in the profession understand that what procedure I do include is, is hopefully accurate, but it's not overweighed and it's, it's very much about, it's more of an adventure as opposed to real life. Um, so most people, you know, you do have that nice close contact with readers. And that is what a book should be. Yeah, right, really. exactly. <laughs> to weigh down with real life too. That's right. Um, I thought, so I've asked you main specific questions about marketing. Are you mm. running ads? I do. I mean, I, uh, yeah, I'll run the odd Facebook ad. Um, they're very good on, you know, uh, being able to identify demographics is very useful information there. Um, you can obviously import from, I use MailChimp for my um, uh, for my mailing list. And so, yes, you can work, it works quite nicely together. So um, we'll run ads that way. Um, dabbled with Amazon ads, but to be honest with you, um, I think Mostly for me, it's it's definitely maintenance of the readership. I think you hit it head on there for me. That is my approach. Um, and then anything else after that is more like icing on the cake. Um, I think really it, it's kind of a basic point again that, and I do say it to people that, if you can get the ball rolling yourself, actually Amazon is geared to help you. It's, it's geared to sell. So if you can actually you sort of get that ball rolling yourself. They're, they're not there to hinder you. It's they're there to try and leverage your own success. So by this stage, you know, again, we're talking nine books in now. Um, after kind of capturing that initial readership, then they were ready and willing to push it out for the next one. And then it just maximizes with every new book that, that comes on. Um, so it's it's very much taking that and just trying to identify ways that I can, you know, help on my side and, and do that. I think indirect marketing as well um, is not a bad thing. I think, you know, just in, in terms of um, socially as well, I mean, people forget this, it's kind of, if you're willing to do a good turn for someone, they will invariably do a good turn for you. And particularly with um, other writers who write in the same sort of genre, that kind of thing. I think you have to look at it very much that it is a shared space, but um, it's a mistake. And I hear it sometimes, and I believe that it's a mistake to think that um, other people who write the same genre as you are competitors because they aren't. Um, people 
like to read, I like to read myself, and the very last thing that you want people doing is putting away their Kindle or their book. You would like people to still be reading similar things or, or kind of styles to you so that when your next book comes out, they're, they're, they're there, ready, waiting, and oh great, next one out. You know, And it's, it's, it's a habit to read. Um, as opposed to uh, scaring people off. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I think often um, helping to promote other writers is actually is something that's a positive move rather than a negative move. Um, on a very simple level, um, I also take the decision I am um, with KDP Select. Uh, so it's I sort of consider that a marketing decision. Um, I think that um, it's. For me, it's it's worked out with my my business, um, and obviously I know that there's some some choose to go wide, and that's definitely a very it's a very individual decision. But for me, it's worked really well. Um, have you always been? I have, yes, and um, and my books have always been in in Ku, for example. Um, and again, I think that's just a whole other market that you're able to reach if you are there as well. Um, particularly, you know. If you then um, haven't been in KU and decide to make the change into KU, for example, that's great because it's almost like relaunching, particularly if you have a series, it's like relaunching an entire series, which is something maybe to think about because that can just regenerate and reinvigorate your whole business. What do you think about um, the, the mainstream bookshops? Because you've sold three million books. I mean, by rights, I should be able to walk into Waterstones and yeah. pick an LJ Ross book up off the shelf, but yeah. that's even for you is quite a difficult place to get to. Well, um, I uh, was have been contacted by um, a couple, you know, things like W. H. Smith, um, and uh, I've, I've certainly my books are in like independent bookshops. But my approach has always been, I think, it comes back to the point I've made several times, which is a question of individuality. So I um, didn't come into this thinking I need to see my books on a shelf in Waterstones, but I consider it a perfectly valid dream that if people want that, that is a separate dream in itself, you know, I think that's something... I understand that. I'm almost thinking about this from a reader's point of yeah. view. I think that, because not everyone has a Kindle, I mean, my, my father yeah, doesn't, he'll sure. probably love your books. He will only probably find them, obviously he's going to find them because I'm going to yeah. put it in front of him, if he walks into W. H. Smith or well, Woodstones. Yeah. It seems to me a, a, it is something that's going to need to have to change in the next few years, one way or another. Yeah, I mean, I have to say my sort of the print side of things just does quite well on Amazon for me. So I'm with, um, well, it was Create Space, but it's now KDP Print. Um, so, I mean, I, I've always been with that as well. And, and actually, I found that, say, a lot of libraries would just go and source directly from there because okay. I just consistently told them, well, well, I'm published through Amazon. So, you know, if, there's, if there is enough of a demand. And I think that that, again, comes back to basic principles because people were going into the libraries saying, I, I really like to read these books in enough of a volume from word of mouth that people had told them. So that the libraries then went onto their databases, sure enough didn't find them there because obviously I'm, I'm, I didn't register with Nielsen or anything like that. Um, and yet they, they sort of pressed override and thought, well, no, we'll, we'll still go and source them. So it is possible, and I think it's a sort of um, misconception that as a, an indie published or, or wholly Amazon published author that you can't find your way into libraries and things like that, because I certainly have. Um, but I, I definitely think it's a question of personality as well, that you haven't to be unafraid of um, going out and finding those opportunities. Um, I think certainly that uh, in terms of accessibility for print, it, it's definitely a business decision for me that I like to make all formats accessible as possible. Um, but I think people, you know, have been quite uh, willing to just go online and Amazon. And let's not forget that whether in print or ebook, it is still um, the largest retailer. So yeah. you know. Yeah, it is. One of the things I noticed doing quite a lot of these interviews is that the more successful authors talk a lot about their readers yeah. and are very grounded mm -hmm. um, about why they're writing and about the product and I really hear that from you so I think it's, uh, it's really good that you've expounded on that a little bit and I guess one of the things we've done this podcast is trying and help people like in yeah. my position starting sure. out you've done quite a lot of that today but what would be your advice as particularly having seen the market change and visibility mm -hmm. is more difficult perhaps than it was in even 2015 when you started what sort of advice would you hand out to uh, people starting the fledglings like me yeah I would say um, be discerning um, because the thing is, with any growing market, um, people have offshoots and, and, you know, you can even just go onto Facebook and you'll see so many adverts for, want to self-publish? Here's the way to do it. But learn to distinguish between a quality organization and it can actually help you, you know, um, to, to learn about what is quite a vast industry now. Um, 
if you're going to do that. But also just to have the confidence. You know, I think um, I think what I would say to people is don't forget the reason you go into it. Um, I think that it's easy to get bogged down and it's very easily done and I think it's easy to have your confidence knocked at the sheer volume of books out there. But not to forget that there's always been a huge volume of books. You know, there's always been but just to remember that you never had this opportunity before. Before this era, there was never a way for people to just take this career into their own hands without having to go through gatekeepers. So it is still a much better climate to be able to push your work out there than it ever was before. And not to, I suppose, um, become too negative or too downcast at the prospect of having to um, be seen within that landscape because it was always going to be hard. Um, but I think uh, that said, invest in your product um, because I think say things like um, I'll often look at like copy or the book description and people will say to me, look, I've done everything I can think of and I can't see why this book isn't doing better. And so I say, well, do, do you mind if I have a look, you know, and I'll, I'll have a look. And I think, well, you know, it seems it seems obvious, but if you've hired a book designer and they send you this beautiful image through and you think, brilliant, I'll buy it. Um, but then reduce it to a thumbnail. How does it look on the Kindle store? And you can barely see the title. You know, it's very, very simple. It sounds like simplistic advice, but so seldom um, achieved as a package. You know, so I would say get everything lined up like that, and then when you think you've done it right, actually then farm it out and get opinions back because um, usually there's something. That objective. Oh, absolutely. Back a little Definitely. Bit. Yeah. Well done again. That was the Queen's crockery coming back, <laughs> having had an afternoon tea at the palace. Um, where do you, you, you're back to Northumberland, I guess, after this. We're, in, we're here for the uh, Storyteller Awards yes, in London. Yes, yeah, that's you're right. You're back to Northumberland, and that's where you write, presumably, in, in the house. I do. Well, I um, have an office uh, in the house, and I write at the kitchen table still, but I like to get out and about and go and sit in coffee shops and things like that, um, because it can be a very sort of uh, solitary profession otherwise, and obviously I'm still wary of writer's arse, you know, everyone worries about that, so... You know, get out and about, go for a walk. <laughs> definitely, standing up is definitely yes. one way to get around writer's arse. Yeah. That's so beautifully put. I um, know. And we should say, take the say, girl out of the north. <laughs> yeah. People who don't know uh, the UK, Northumberland is beautiful. It's just a very, very beautiful part of the country, so mm -hmm. um, I can see the attraction. Louise, it's been thrilling uh, oh, talking well. to you. I've really enjoyed it. Oh, and me too. Thanks I for having me. Well, no, you're very welcome. It's been a really valuable interview, so thank you. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. There we go. So there's Louise and something I learned that I didn't know is the J in LJ Ross is for James because he plays a big part in her success in terms of uh, the marketing. He was there at the beginning, uh, uh, perhaps with an eye to the market and the way things were going and said to her, why are we still writing to agents? Let's publish this ourselves. And, um, and they have not looked back. No, no. James is is pretty savvy. He's uh, we we we've had a few interesting conversations about algorithms and and that kind of stuff. And he's a barrister, so um, you know, obviously a, a pretty smart guy. Um, and also writing his his first novel as well. Um, and you'll be pleased to know you are well ahead of him. Um, he's wow. he's been stuck on ten thousand words for at least the last year. So. Oh. Um, I've written 10,000 words lots of times. <laughs> you have, that's very true. <laughs> yes, so um, no, it's, it's, it's a real success story. I mean, they, they, they've done incredibly well um, and lovely to... We're trying to get them on the podcast for a little while, so it's good to get them on finally. Yeah, definitely. Uh, if you want to catch up on my novel writing experience, there is a blog post uh, on our website at selfpublishingformula.com if you go to the blog page, and I'll add another edition. But the headline is still going stormingly. Still going stormingly, although I do have two chapters to produce between now and tomorrow night. Yeah, basically, pull your finger out. And um, I, well, I was, it's quite funny. You keep giving in, me work to do. I was in Boston speaking to the BookBub um, team when we went over there. And um, Carlin, who works for BookBub, came up to me afterwards and said, um, I just listened to the episode of the podcast with um, Jenny Nash and, and James. And um, Jenny's my mum. So, was, um, and then uh, Carlin came down to Florida for Nink, and um, so I introduced the two of you, and um, and you're yeah. both you both owe um, Carlin's mum something. Uh, <laughs> we, Carlin, we do. Although I'm the only one paying her, <laughs> unless uh, unless <laughs> Carlin's you, moved back I, home. Maybe you'll you'll birth something as well. Yes, maybe. Uh, that would be nice. Um, yes, Carlin was uh, was really great to meet her, and she's a, a credit to Jenny. And I dropped Jenny a note. Uh, 
uh, to that effect after meeting her. And um, I think that their plan is to try and end up at the same conference at the same time one day, which would be really nice. And um, yeah, no, I uh, I can't speak highly enough about uh, Jenny. And I thought she's come across really well, both in the interview and in the book lab um, excerpt we had with her. She's somebody who really understands and can articulate why stories work, why they don't work and some of the traps to avoid. And um, offering us that info dumps PDF was a, was a great thing. I've had some good feedback on that. So yeah, so things are going well on that front at the moment. Good, good. Well, um, I'm hoping to write a novel in November so we can have a race if you like. Yeah. Are you going to do NaNoWriMo? I might do. Yeah. I'm thinking, not that I've ever done it before. I don't, I don't feel I need to do it, but I think no. it's kind of, it's coming at a good time. Um, so I'm, I'm working on finishing something this month and then I'll have, I'd like to get something done um, by the end of the year. So, you know, is it 50,000 words? I should probably do that in a week. Um, yeah. So it's like two and a half thousand a day, something like that. Is that right? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. I'm going to try and dictate it as well. So that'll be um, an interesting experiment. Yeah. Um, it doesn't really quite suit the stage I am at with my yeah. writing at the moment, but um, because it's a good first draft thing, I think it'd be yeah. perfect if you yeah. could get around to the point of thinking I'm going to knock out a first draft and uh, for November, so maybe next November. Good. Okay, thank you very much indeed for watching. If you're watching on YouTube, um, my picture changed from a beautiful, expensively produced DSLR picture to the sort of thing that we see Mark standing behind, a webcam. But I'm going to try and introduce Mark to the world of the DSLR. Oh it's a bit like I had my dad, my 87 year old father visited this morning because Microsoft Word wasn't working. And you can imagine how my heart sinks. I feel a little bit the same going to teach how to use a camera. <laughs> I'm sure I can manage. I'm sure you can. OK, good. Thank you very much indeed for watching and listening this week. We will be back next Friday with another superb episode of the Self Publishing Formula podcast. Bye bye. You've been listening to the Self Publishing Formula podcast. Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes, and links on today's topics. You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.